truly having surrendered your life to Him. He has delivered you and rescued you by His great power and His strong <coughs> And we serve Him because we love Him. Look at uh, verse 11. Oh Lord, please hear my prayer. Listen to the prayers of those of us who delight in honoring you. Now, when was the last time you, somebody said, hey, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just sitting here delighting in honoring God. You know? Have you ever said that? Like, ever? <laughs> we don't talk like that. But this is a reality that shows in our life. Do we have a delight in honoring God? Notice he goes on to say, please, please grant me success today by making the king favorable to me. Put it into his heart to be kind to me. Now, Nehemiah is the cupbearer. He's, he's just a servant. But because he's making sure that the king doesn't die from poison wine and that he gets whatever he wants, oh king, he has to make sure the king's happy with this. When he shows up one day looking sad, the king says, oh, what's wrong? This is not an illness. I'm looking at you. I'm saying you're distraught about something. And so then it is at this point that Nehemiah is saying, oh, here's my chance. God has given me the opening to be able to talk to the king about my people. Notice in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 16. Uh, yeah, there we go. The city officials there in Jerusalem, when Nehemiah gets there, they don't really know why Nehemiah is there. I mean, they know he's there to do something, but what? And so he sneaks out in the night with a few people and he goes traveling around Jerusalem in the dark to see what's going on. He hasn't explained his plans. And so in verse 17, after he's done that, he now says to them, you know very well what trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins. Its gates have been destroyed by fire. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. You see... When it comes to God's time for a change, His power is going to be there to do it. He's going to raise up people for that purpose. Are you a person that's available to God for a profound change in what needs to happen in your family, for what needs to happen in your church, for what needs to happen in your workplace? Are you a person that can rally brothers and sisters in Christ and say, look, where we are. Look at, look at our budget, church. Look at, look at our this. Look at our that. And we can look at those things and go, oh. But that's not where it's headed. Where it's headed is, you know very well the trouble that we're in, but let's rebuild the wall. Let's end this disgrace. Let's make ourselves available through the graciousness of God to be a part of what He's going to do to bring restoration. Verse 18. Then what does Nehemiah tell him? <laughs> then I told him about how the gracious hand of God had been on him. There it is again, the gracious hand of God. About my conversation with the king, and they replied at once, Yes. Let's rebuild the wall. And so they began the good work. Now when you start a good work for God, you've got to anticipate this next part, right? Because if you don't anticipate, you're going to be discouraged. If you start to say, okay, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop smoking. I'm going to start praying with my spouse. I'm going to start reading the Bible. I'm going to start uh, ministering to my children uh, the good news of Christ. I'm going to start whatever it is. And you say, I'm going to do this. You had better expect opposition on a spiritual level that may show up through a physical response from somebody that you love. But in this case, here it is, those people who had already been in the land, they hear what's going on and they scoff at them contemptuously. Can I give you some more current language? They make fun of them with hate speech. They're using their best hate speech and ridiculing them, whatever it is, to make them feel like what they're doing. It's worth it. What are you doing? Are you guys going to rebel against the king? Whoa, wait a second. Why did he say that? Is he going to send the king a letter? 
O King, we got these people over here, and they're making a plan, and you need to come over here and, and deal with them. And so they're using threats. Notice what it said in verse 20. Nehemiah says, The God of heaven will help us succeed. We, his servants, will start rebuilding this wall. But you, Sam Ballad, and all of you other people, you have no share, no legal right, no historic claim to Jerusalem. Whoa! Did I just hear something that needs to be said in Israel today? Absolutely true. No one, according to God, has a right to it at all. Guess who that land belongs to? Him. It's his. And who did he choose to give it to? Israel. And so now because God has done this, they say to the Arabs that are there, to the Ammonites, to the Amorites, to the people who were there from the other lands who came there while they were being dispersed, people took their place. And he says, look, you folks are saying you want to help. We know what you're doing. You're just going to try to stall us out. But here's the deal. you got no dog in this fight. Head out. And so as you think about what is going to be the thing that is going to help you, help your church, help your family, is it going to be all of the people who have all of the things out there that we think we have to have? Or is it going to be the reality that you are a child of God and you belong to Him and His Word is powerful and His Spirit can work powerful change in our lives and experience? Is that not the truth? Yeah. All right, if that's the truth, then that's where we need to be going with all the things that we're doing as well. In verse, chapter 4, verse 6, you get to success. How many people like success? We got any success likers in here? No. Nobody likes success except Ramona. The rest of y'all need to go talk to Ramona. She knows something about it, I think. At last, the wall was completed to half its height. At least there's something to duck behind, right? And that's important. So when they see they're making progress, they're so happy for the Jews, aren't they? Now, in the verse 7, they were furious. And they all made plans to come and fight against Jerusalem and throw us into confusion. But we prayed to our God and guarded the city day and night to protect ourselves. Whoa, wait, wait a second. Make up your mind. No, you can't prep and then trust in God. You preppers, you know, don't be guarding and protecting yourselves. You're supposed to pray. But what did they do? Uh -huh. Acknowledge the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and you ignore it. You're acknowledging God first, right? And then you use what God puts in your hand to do what needs to be done. So we pray to our God and guard us for day and night to protect ourselves. It's a wise action. See, the leaders were not able to do all these things. Each and every person had to do their part. Look at verse 14. He looks over the situation and he gets together the nobles, which, by the way, have spent most of their time watching everybody work. And the rest of the people, he says, look, don't be afraid of the enemy. Here's his direction. Two things. Remember the Lord and walk. Fight. Remember the Lord, who is the great and glorious, and Fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. You see, folks, this is not an either-or thing with God. This is a, a together thing with God that starts with putting Him first. So that we know who our real friends are, and we know who our real enemies are, and we know what kinds of preparations to make, because God is first. Our enemies heard, and we knew their plans, and God had frustrated them. What were they able to do? Get back to work. Verse 16. From then on, here's what we do. Some of us are going to guard. 
some of us are going to work, but even the people who are working are going to be having some way to defend themselves in their hand or on their hip. Right? Well, we can't possibly do that. I don't have a concealed sword license. Right? Oh, excuse me. I think that this is in the Word of God for a reason. That we can understand that God is not without common sense. And that He can use our efforts if our efforts are focused on Him. But as you look at verse 20 and 21 and 23, here's what I want you to see as you look through that. This preparation that they are making for personal defense has a spiritual application to me and to you. You see, flesh and blood, not our enemy, according to the New Testament. Principalities and powers of dark are behind the people who are our enemies. If you took away the influence of the demonic and the satanic, many of those people who are our enemies would then, if they came to faith in Christ, be one of us. And so, as we understand these things, folks, we have got to carry our weapons with us at all times. Because our weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're powerful. But they're spiritual weapons. And so, as I put on the full armor, as a child of God each day, to go out and serve God, one of the things that I, I'm putting on, the helmet of salvation... And the, you know, all the, the breastplate and all those things. But one of the things I have is a sword. And that sword is the Word of God. And the Word of God is power. Not only for me, but as I affect and influence other situations. You see today, those of us who have received Christ as Lord and Savior, we understand these things. Whether we're living in them or not, would show you probably just how effective our faith has been and how well we serve the Lord. Sometimes that's good. Sometimes not so much. And that's one of those moments of realization where we, like Nehemiah and Ezra, we cry out to God and ask for His forgiveness and His help and His strength to serve Him. But for those who have not yet responded to the gracious hand of God, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 tells us this. Is for by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. So today, if you've not received Jesus as Lord and Savior, you're not going to get there by being a good person. Nicodemus in John chapter 3 was a good guy. He was a great guy. But Jesus told him he wasn't going to go to heaven unless he was born again. There's a spiritual birth that has to happen. And it's not dumped in the water, walking down the aisle. It is a moment where the Holy Spirit intersects your life and makes you aware of your need for Christ because of your sin. And you surrender your life and you say yes to Jesus and ask Him to come in and save you and make you a child of God. And you turn your life over to Him. And He graciously, loving, takes away your sin saves you and makes you a child of God. And so that's how you're saved, by God's gracious hand upon you and your faith and trust in Jesus and Jesus alone to save you. It's not as a result of works. If it was, you could brag about I'm such a good person, I am going to heaven. No, not according to God. But folks, once you are a born-again child of God, please notice verse 10. <coughs> Please, I, I'm reminded constantly. We are His workmanship. I didn't make myself any good thing that I am as a result of being a follower of Christ. That's something He did. Amen. In my flesh, I am still wicked and sinful and worthless to God. That's why I have to walk in the Spirit and let the Spirit overcome the flesh. Amen. Spiritually, I've been set free from sin and death. But my old fleshly ways, given the opportunity, will come back to do what their thing is. I don't have to live in the flesh anymore. 
I am now His workmanship. I have been created in Christ Jesus. For what? Well, the church may think it's to sit and to soak and to sap. Because that's often what happens in church. People don't serve the Lord, they just sit. They soak in everything from the Word of God and they get used to saying, no, God, I know that's really for Him. What you're saying, I know, but you're really saying that to her. And we don't allow ourselves to be affected by the work of the Holy Spirit. And then what happens is, because we keep saying no to God, we sour right where we are yeah. to serve God. What we've been called to do is good works, good deeds. Not the ones that we pick. My good deed, I've, I've got one. I'm going to stand at the Bluebell counter, and every person that comes up from Bluebell, I'm going to offer to test it for them to make sure it's not poisonous. <laughs> That's my good deed. No. I'm going to do the ones that God prepared. God prepared them beforehand. And so I have to know the Word of God to know what God has prepared as the work He wants me to be involved in. And then I'm going to be a part of those things. I'm going to walk that walk. I'm going to live that walk. Brothers and sisters in Christ, are we there today? Well, we're there. We struggle. We have to, we have to submit ourselves to God and get that fellowship restored by His grace. We need to always be prepared to do that. But if you've not ever surrendered your heart and life to Christ, we're going to do something right now simply as a, an opportunity to give you the chance to do that. Would you pray with me? Father, we ask in Jesus' name that you would hear the prayer of the person who's here today. Maybe they've gone to church for a long, long time.